Now that you know how to write an explication or a critique for humanities, let's get some practice. In this lesson, we'll drop in on a class critiquing each other's essays. Let's see how they do it. Okay, we are dealing this week with explication. You know, we began to deal with it last week. And um, let's go back just a minute and look at the root of the word, to explicate. Um, can you think of any other word that has, this word breaks into X and plick. Can you think of any other word that has the plick root? Do you mean complicate? Okay, complicate, you know, a word which, which certainly epitomizes our modern lifestyle. Okay, complicate, to make things more involved. All right, the plick word in complicate means to fold. Now, when things are complicated, they're folded into themselves. They are made more complicated. But when we explicate, all right, let's look at the word. Where do we run into X? other than, you know, say, ex-husbands or something like that. <laughs> All right, exit, to fold out, to make things clear. And that's what we're doing when we explicate. We're attempting to clarify. We're clarifying our understanding of the work that we've read. Okay, last week when we were looking at things an explanation, an explication should not have. Remember, we looked at some no-nos. Okay, we said an explication basically is not a paraphrase of the work. We're not retelling the story. You know, Hemingway told it best. We are not, we're not synopsizing it. We're not retelling it. We're not summarizing the plot. We generally, unlike our research papers, we're not adding historical or biographical data unless there is a reason for doing that. So those are some, you know, those are some of our basic guidelines. Some of the things that we do, we're trying to integrate our viewpoint into the work. Again, we're clarifying. What did we, you know, people say, um, we never all read the same work. We bring our own experiences to the work. And so what is, you know, what did we get out of this? So we are, you know, we're clarifying the meaning of the work as we received it. We may use relevant source material. And we're going to look at two essays that were written in another class that I, I think will clarify this. And one of them uses a lot of source material and one of them doesn't. Now, in terms of the general overall form, we might follow the work's organization. Remember last week we were working on a poem, the explication of a poem. And we explicated it basically line by line by line. All right. Um, I want to give us sort of a framework to hang our critique on. And the one I use is the, um, it's called the I bow framework. Okay? Okay. Can you take a bow over what you have written? And you can if you use this sort of checklist to go over what you've written. Okay, the I. All right, the I are images. Images and examples. Okay, have you, have you clarified your point by referring to the images and the examples that the author uses? Okay, specifically the sensory images. All right, they are the writer's stock in trade. They are the thing that clarifies the message. Okay, let's check this just for a minute. All right, um, I'm going to send you a message, and I'm going to see if we all receive the same message. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to close your eyes. Okay, everybody close your eyes. Okay? Now, the message I am going to send you, he came into the class, and he had long hair. Now, everybody, I want you to put your fingers to indicate how long you think his hair was. Okay, put your fingers somewhere. All right, how long was his hair? Leave your finger there. Leave it there. Okay, don't move your finger, but open your eyes. Okay, now, Trisha's long hair. Long to her conveyed the image of down to the shoulder. 
Okay, Laszlo's long hair. Long to him was down, farther. Okay, the word long does not convey a specific image. But if you say ear length, and again, this is something we can use in our actual writing of our explications. And this is something we pick up on in the good writers. The exact use of sensory image. So images, images and examples, that's the I part of the I bow. Okay, the B. The B is beginning. Now, you know, I've often referred to the beginning of your writing as your hook. Okay, you're an effective writer if you get someone to read what you've written. You know, you can be wonderfully effective in your mind, but if no one wants to read after the first line, if you have no audience, if you haven't hooked your audience, then you're not as effective as you could be. Okay, so when you're checking through your explication, my beginning, what was it like? Did it have the power of attraction? Okay, O. All right, O is opinion, personal opinion. Now, I want you to make the universal negative sign, you know, like Ghostbusters, put the circle with the line through it, over opinion. Because you want to be very careful with that in terms of explication. You want to steer away from personal opinion unless you support it from the work. Now, you'll hear me say that a lot, supported from the work. There are some people who write explications with what I call the trampoline method, okay? They take one bounce, they refer to the work one time, and then zoom, they're off in the ozone, and they never come back to the trampoline. Uh, one of my students several years ago wrote on Old Man in the Sea. He referred to Old Man in the Sea one time, and the rest of the paper was on bass fishing. <laughs> okay, I learned a lot about bass fishing, but I did not learn too much about Old Man in the Sea as a literary work, okay? All right, now the W on the I bow method. The W is writers. If you cited any other writers, give credit, identify. If you use another work, then I want you to say who authored that work. Give enough information so your reader could find that work and check out your use of it. Okay. Now, we've got these sort of general guidelines, and these are not exhaustive. I mean, there are certainly some other things that we'll look at. But we have these general ones, so what I want us to do, I've selected two papers from my um, other section. And I want us to hear the papers, and then I want us to evaluate the papers kind of based on the eye bow. How do the writers of the papers, how have they critiqued it? Now, we're going to have two very different kinds of papers. We're going to have um, one that is much more research-based and one that's much more personally interpretive, but not a trampoline paper. Okay, not one that just bounces one time, but one that uses the book, uses the short story, Indian Camp, as its basic reference. So, um, all right, um, John, you have Mark's paper, don't you? Okay, would you read for us Mark's paper, and then we're going to look at it as a group, okay? Okay. What they don't teach you in medical school. In the midst of the embrace, in in the midst of embracing the principles of life and death, a medical student learns a valuable lesson which becomes a cornerstone for building his or her entire career. It is not taught in a specific class, and whether it happens in medical school, during internship, or residency is uncertain. What is certain is that it happens. At some point, a doctor learns to establish emotional distance when attending to the needs of his patients, while still trying to display the compassion that human suffering deserves. Although mankind is bombarded daily with images of life and death, none are as vivid as what a doctor encounters. People vicariously experience death as spectators of life's tragic moments. One can read about it in the newspaper or see it on TV, but seldom does it crash into one's own life as a violent reminder of the frailty and mortality of man. 
For the most part, death keeps her distance until it is least expected. But for a doctor, she waits around every corner. She will rouse him from his restless, on-call slumber, only to announce she has made her final rounds. Emotional detachment becomes his greatest friend. The doctor in Ernest Hemingway's short story, Indian Camp, manifests the characteristics of a man who has taken detachment to the furthest extreme. Dr. Adams, along with his son Nick, journeys to an Indian camp where a squaw has been in labor for almost two days. As they enter the camp, the reader can almost hear the tormented screams of the mother in childbirth as Hemingway paints the following picture. She screamed, just as Nick and the two Indians followed her father and Uncle George into the shanty. She lay in the lower bunk, very big under a quilt. In the upper bunk was her husband. Nick's, fa Nick's father provides a fairly straightforward description of the pain that is transacting, but it is his response to the screams that demonstrate the detachment which he approaches his role. What, is she, what she is going through is called being in labor. All her muscles are trying to get the baby to be born. That is what is happening when she screams. When Nick asks, asks his father to alleviate her pain, Dr. Adams responds, no, I don't have any anesthetic, but her screams are not important. I don't hear them because they are not important. Not only has he become incapable of ministering to the needs of his patient, he is without anesthetic, but he no longer sees this as his role. Her screams are not important. Dr. Adams has become desensitized to the pain of his patient. His job is to deliver the baby, which he does at the greatest emotional distance possible. It has become impossible for him to display the compassion that suffering deserves. After the cesarean is completed, Dr. Adams is seen in his most insensitive moment. He was feeling exalted and talkative as football players are in the dressing room after a game. When he says, that's one for the medical journal, George, doing a cesarean with a jackknife and sewing it up with nine-foot tapered gut leaders, it appeared that he is proud of the ruthless, raw procedure that he has successfully accomplished. The reader is inclined to interpret this as spoken with a spirit of cruel jesting. One can argue that sarcasm and jest continue to be a mechanism for maintaining emotional distant, distance in today's medical arena. The story takes a violent, ironic twist as the words of Dr. Adams, her screams are not important, come back to haunt him. After completing the cesarean, he climbs to the top bunk and to inform the husband that the surgery has been successful. The Indian lay with his face towards the wall. His throat has been cut from ear to ear. The blood flowed down into a pool where his body sagged the bunk. The Indian, unable to cope with the intense pain and constant screaming of his wife, had taken his own life by slitting his throat at the same time that Dr. Adams disregarded the suffering. The screams had not been important to Dr. Adams, yet they determined the destiny of the Indian brave by driving him to suicide. The husband had been so emotionally close to the screams that the only solution was to drown them out forever. Dr. Adams had been so emotionally distanced that he heard only them as a faint whisper. It's no wonder that there is a high rate of suicide and alcoholism among doctors in this country. How many other professions require you to stare death in the face every day while the world around you pretends life will last forever? Emotional distance is a crucial element in the performance of any doctor, but taken to an extreme, it can destroy the empath empathetic sense required for those who would effectively practice medicine. Okay, thanks, John. All right, let's run through it just run through the four points here. Okay, images. Now he picked some images that to me were some of the most graphic ones in the story. What do you remember just listening to the paper? What, what image sticks in your mind from hearing John read? Allison. The throat laceration from ear to ear. Yeah. Okay, not just that the Indian was dead, but he was cut from ear to ear. Okay, again, a very powerful image there. Okay, and that image dealing with emotion. We're dealing here with the two faces of emotion. The doctor has been emotionally removed, and he has to in order to do his job. The father, the husband in the bunk above, is so emotionally close that he has to kill himself because of the pain. All right, any other images that you remember from, the sto from what John just read? We've got the throat cut, and to me, the, the doing it with a jackknife and sewing up with tapered gut leader. Okay, highly specific. Now, you know, this is an aside, but as we're writing this kind of thing, we want to be specific ourselves, specific in our use of verbs, specific in our use of metaphor. Um, 
Okay, now this paper is what's called a paper of interpretation. John did not go to outside sources. He reacted to the paper and developed his opinion that in the medical profession, there has to be a certain amount of distance. Okay, he selected the images that showed the distance, the power of the scene, and yet the reaction of the father, the reaction of the doctor. High contrast with those two images. All right, let's, let's look at the beginning here. John, read me just the beginning couple of lines again. Let's see if, if this does indeed do what it's supposed to do, provide a hook for the reader. In the midst of embracing the principles of life and death, a medical student learns a valuable lesson which becomes a cornerstone for building his or her entire career. It is not taught in a specific class, and whether it happens in medical school, during internship, or resi residency is uncertain. What is certain is that it happens. At some point, a doctor learns to establish emotional distance when attending to the needs of his patients, while still trying to display the compassion that human suffering deserves. Okay, this is our beginning. Now remember, our, we want to attract a reader. How attractive was this beginning? Galen. I thought it was good because it was a, a, a very ambitious statement to remark at the um, beginning of the paper that they're going to build their entire career on this. Okay, this is a cornerstone. Right. What, what is this cornerstone that the medical establishment must know? in order to be effective. Yeah, I thought, you know, I think as a beginning, as a teacher reading thousands of papers, it caught my attention. So I think we can check that off. As a beginning, that was effective. All right. Um, if we look at opinions here, were there any opinions in this paper that you questioned or that you thought were um, possibly not supported? Remember, it's OK to have the opinion but we need to support it. Okay, did you, did you hit any opinions in here that you were... There were two, and again, I'm, I'm jumping into the, the silence, but there were two that struck me, and I just want to play this off of you. Uh, one was the fact, um, it's no wonder there's a high rate of suicide and alcoholism among doctors in this country. If we look at page 166, if we look at that one, um, you know, that one is not supported. He has made this statement here. And I won't belabor that, but I think when you're writing, be careful with the unsupported opinions. Now, this one, again, was an interpretive explication. So he did not refer to other writers. So the W part, the writer, if you use another writer, then identify your source. We don't have to deal with that in here. OK? Now let's look at a very different type of essay. Um, Allison, you have Julie's essay, right? OK, would you read? Um, and I think we'll work on this one maybe paragraph by paragraph. This is a research-based explication. Now, you'll notice the difference in tone. This does not deal with the work, Indian camp. It does not deal with it only. Remember when you were writing the research papers, you went out and you read the sources. Here we're going to pull in some sources to support, to clarify. All right, Julie, give it to me. Nick's Fall from Innocence. When Ernest Hemingway introduced the character of Nick Adams to the reading world in 1938, he created a character that became indelibly imprinted in the minds and hearts of his reading audience. Stop right there. All right, now let's, let's look at this. This is a pretty powerful statement. What's the word in there? What's the allegation? What's the word in there that he says this person has done? Oh, imprinted, indelibly imprinted. All right, now we're going to see, we're going to see if this is why this is so. Okay, Julie, keep going. Indian Camp was the first of a series of short stories and set the backdrop for all the Nick stories that were to come. Nick Adams, claimed by some critics to be an archetypal Adam, leads his reader through a perpetual fall from innocence as he constantly encounters and responds to experiences which reflect a world of chaos. 
In his essay, Initiation, from Indian Camp and the Doctor's Wife, the author claims the naming of Hemingway's character served as a literary device, typifying the entire human race encountering irrational elements in their environment and forced to reconcile them. Now stop just a moment. All right, let's go back to the W part. All right, what did I say if you quote any work? What must you do? John. Um, you must cite the writer who wrote the quote. Okay. Now, in this particular paper, what has he said there? Has he cited the writer? No. No, he has said the author. Okay, we want to be careful about that. We're using someone else's work. Now, you know the, the evil P word, plagiarism. Okay, this, this would not be counted as a plagiarism, but we do want to give people credit if we are using their ideas. All right, now, if we, you know, here we're dealing with a theme. We're dealing with the eternal theme of good and evil. Okay, keep going. Allison. He notes the parody of Old Nick, another name for Satan, the archetype of evil. Thus, in one name, the struggle between good and evil is reflected. Nick Adams, throughout his life, attempts to maintain a balance between these two elements as he encounters a series of experiences and adventures that define a departure of innocence and lead to the realization of the fallen nature, chaos, and ultimate death which pervades man's existence. It is in Indian camp that we see Nick at his youngest. As a result of his immaturity, he is unable to manifest an understanding of the chaotic world which he discovers at the camp and thus denies the experience that, the, that characterizes his initial fall from innocence. Okay, now we've, we've had the beginning here. All right, let's have, let's have a reaction to the beginning. What, you've read the beginning, you've heard the beginning, what, what's your reaction to the beginning? He mentioned Satan. Okay, Satan. All right, that, that, there's a power image there. Satan, good, evil, the fall, Adam. The boy's name bringing both light and dark together. Old Nick and Adam, darkness and light. Okay, we have a lot of things going here. It's a very complicated beginning. Now, let's skip over. Gee, I don't think... I don't think um, I don't think we've got enough class left to read the entire thing, but I wanted us to use, look at the use of images. Let's flip over to the next page, and let's look at the way the writer's dealing with darkness and light, evil and good. Let's look at the use of the light images. Julie, would you read, um, okay, let's, let's start with the light images right there in the middle. The light images in Indian camp further reflect that Nick is about to journey into new knowledge as he travels from darkness into light. It was much lighter on the logging road as the timber was cut away on both sides. Ahead were the lights of the shanties. In the shanty nearest the road, there was a light in the window. The description of an old woman who stood in the doorway holding a lamp recalls the symbol of the knowledge of good and evil, inviting Nick to enter into a new understanding of the predicament of mankind. Okay. Now, we have a number of images that we've pulled together, and we've made a statement here. We've made a statement that what these are doing, they are inviting Nick to enter into a new understanding. All right, the writer can do that if it's based on the information. Um, notice the use of quotes. Notice the use of um, the ellipses where the writer has said, I am using part of this, but there's more. Okay, these are, are technical things, but the use of the images from the story, it's very, very important. And again, you may look at these images and you may see them working a different way. And that's the power of writing. You can pull the images together and you can say, this means this, this particular, this means this to me, and that's fine. But bounce back on the trampoline of the work. Use your sources. Don't simply pick up one image and flip off into the ozone. Secure. Anchor yourself in the work. Um, let's look at the very bottom. Go to the very last page and let's read the last paragraph, the way it was pulled together. In the early morning on the lake, sitting in the stern of the boat with his father rowing, he felt sure that he would never die. As Joseph Flohr points out in Hemingway's Nick Adams, from this point on he will struggle to come to grips with the idea of death, especially his own death, which he briefly catches a glimpse of at the camp, but then loses. Okay, now, Julie has 
Julie has done what she should do here. She has identified the author of the source that she's used. Okay, um, again, two very different kinds of essays. We've dealt with one essay that was primarily um, interpretive. And that was the one, what they don't teach you in medical school. And then we've looked at the research-based explication. But let's remember, on both of them, we need to do the four things that I mentioned. Okay, we need to select the images and the examples that will support our opinion. We need to really sharpen up our beginning. We want a hook that will grab our reader, that will pull our reader into what we have written. We want to avoid unsupported personal opinion. All right, there will definitely be some opinion, but we want to be very careful with the, the wild card of just sticking something in. And if we use someone else's work, if we use the work of another writer, we want to be absolutely sure that we support, that we cite everything that we need to concerning that writer. Okay? So let's, for our next assignment, let's look over these two essays and see what we can do in terms of clarifying them according to the guidelines. Okay? And I will see you next session. Well, as you can see, writing for the humanities is different from writing in other fields. But in many ways, all good writing requires you to be well organized and to express yourself clearly. With good organization and clarity of expression, you'll be on your way to being a good writer in any field.